The very first thing we're going to look at then is making sure that everybody can follow along and just to make sure that the general layout of the project is somewhat universal. If yours doesn't look like this, this should be the default layout. I haven't changed anything, but if yours is for some reason looking different, then what you can do is we'll come up here to the top panel, go to window, go down to load layout and change this back to the default editor layout. So this will just change everything. You can see as a small refresh there. As I said, mine looks pretty much exactly the same because I haven't changed anything, but you may have a few extra windows docked or you may be missing something. It's very easy to come in and maybe like close those out and then you've lost your outliner and the details panel. Uh, these are quite important because they give you information about the things that you have selected in the world. So again, if you do something like that, you can very easily just load the layout back to your default editor. You can also bring these back in. So if you do something like that, if you uh, misclick and close something, all of these are just classed as windows. And we can add these back in by simply going back up to windows. For instance, I've first of all closed the outliner. So if I do that again, we've lost the outliner. But we can go to window, go to outliner, and we'll add back one of these back in. And it'll dock that back on this side over here. We can also drag these around. So if we grab the tab, we can put these in different parts of the editor. You can see it provides a kind of grid and it will snap it to the part of the grid the mouse is in, or we can have this floating. So you can customize your editor as well. Uh, again, if you customize things, you find you don't like it and you want it back to how it was, but you can't remember, just remember, load default, default editor. Just play around with this. So the, the one thing about this is I know it's going to be really fun to jump in, start getting the characters moving around and adding all of the features, uh, but really give yourself some time to just get familiar and comfortable with the editor. Learn what everything does, uh, because that will help as you want to, to get more advanced with things and start really diving in. It's going to save you so much time if you're really comfortable and familiar with how to navigate the editor rather than just trying to dive in and follow tutorials and you probably end up getting stuck because you don't know where things are, or what they're clicking. So We'll do the boring stuff, get that out of the way, and you'll definitely find that your progress down further down the line will be that much faster. So that's the windows. Uh, that's how we can add new windows. Now, one thing that we're going to want to do quite soon is add some content to our world. There's a little thing down here called the uh, in the bottom left hand side called the content drawer. We can click this. This will open up an entire new panel. If you wanted this to stay where it is, because every time you click away, this will disappear then we can dock this in the layout. This will add it as another window, so very similar to the other windows that we've seen. And this is basically where we find all of our content in our project. So one thing which is really important to uh, distinguish here is that the Fortnite and the Epic folders will be provided in all of your projects, but they are read-only. These are things which are in the Fortnite game or provided by Epic. And for that reason, we can see that if we hover over any of these, they're read-only. This basically means that if we were to double click this, we'll get a little warning down here just saying that we're unable to edit these. And that's the standard kind of expected behavior. When we come to adding in our own assets, though, what we'll find is that if we were to double click on things, we'll open things up in a new window and we can start playing around with their properties. But these are very much pre-made and ready to use. So what we can do is let's say we wanted this active power cell in our world. We quite simply grab this, drag this in, you can see that it will find the nearest colliding surface and snap it to that surface, which is really handy. Uh, if we bring in something else, we'll see that if we put this up on the table, again, it's snapping at this. So it's got some very clever kind of collision detection and it will try and put it on a surface where possible. So this is our, and let's just press Control Z there to get rid of the second thing. And that's as difficult as it is to get something in the world inside of our editor. For me, uh, I quite like having the extra screen space, so I'm going to close the content browser. And another thing which is really handy when you're getting used to working in an editor like this, and this is the same for any game engine, uh, which is going to be another selling point of using Creative 2 in the UEFN. Th this is going to make it much more comfortable if you ever wanted to try out Unity or actually building something, your own game inside of Unreal Engine 5, for example. Getting comfortable with an editor like this is a skill set in itself. And one thing that really helps is getting familiar with the shortcuts. So the content drawer, for example, if we wanted to quickly show and hide this, we just press control and space. So control and space, and you can open or close the content drawer. And like I've said, if you click anywhere, it goes away anyway. So this is a nice quick way to access all of the things that you might want to place in the world and start playing around with. Then the next thing, once we get comfortable with that, is that when you have things in the world, of course, we might want to scale, move, or rotate. So generally affecting what is called their transform. And to do that, we've got these buttons up here. So we can select objects, which is with Q, then this will allow us to select objects, although we're in select mode anyway. So by default, even if we change these modes to transform 
variables such as scaling and rotating, we still click on things regardless. So the next thing is we have translate, which is uh, meaning to move basically. So we can see that when I press that, I've just homed in there with F, which is a shortcut to zoom in on the selected object. Uh, with one of these selected, we can see we've get this red, green, blue arrow widget being shown, uh, basically allowing us to move that around in the direction of the arrow that we're selecting. Now again, it's going to be super useful for you to quickly begin to remember the shortcuts of the things that you're finding you're using a lot. And if you hover over any of these buttons, we can see there's in brackets a letter, which is the keyboard shortcut. So for translate, which is move, we have W, rotate, we have E. So if I press this, then we'll have rotate and we can go between W, E and R, which is scale. So we see that scale is R. Uh, so if we go between these, that will give us our translate rotate and scale shortcuts. So rotation again does exactly what you'd expect. It will rotate around the axis that you're dragging here and scale of course will scale it either if you drag this widget from the middle then that will go across all of the different uh, scales so the x, y and the z. If we use the blue one that will scale up, forward and sideways. So that's what we have here and again just pressing Control z standard undo button. Try and get familiar with these as quickly as possible. Being able to just quickly switch between these with a press for key is going to save you a lot of time. And one other thing you might like to know is we have when we have something selected here on the right hand side we can grab anything from the world. So if we grab this again then you'll see that that reflects the world outliner over here. The alternative is that we could grab something. So I've just grabbed the armchair and you can see the armchair becomes selected in our viewport. Then the other thing is the transform that I've just been manipulating. So with the translate, the rotate and the scale, all of those details are tracked here in the details panel under the transform of the object that we have selected. So we have our active power cell selected and I've been playing around with some of the movement location and specifically we can see that this is still kind of rotated. Uh, so it's rotated minus 10 on the Y axis here, the green axis. So if we wanted to zero that back out, we can just type in zero. You can see that's updated the rotation of the object. And then if I wanted this to be back on the ground, there's a shortcut key for this as well. If we press the end key, mine is above the numpad, then that will snap the object to the nearest colliding plane that it can find. Okay, so again, very, very useful things because you will find quite often that you might be dragging things around and you'll be moving a bunch of things and maybe some of them end up kind of floating in the air. So again, end key, the end key is the shortcut to get anything to snap back to the floor. Okay, so that is how we get assets into the world, how we can move them around, the, the very basics of what information is kind of being stored and displayed and where we can find that. And there's a ton of other things that you can find under the details of the object in the details panel that you have selected. But again, all of this will make a lot more sense as we go through. Uh, what I would say is between these videos, just play around with things like there's so much that you can do. Just start dragging things around, get comfortable with those shortcuts. Uh, it's one of those things where just repetition, keep bringing things in, moving them around in different ways, keeping a lookout for the, the hovering effect where you can find the shortcuts whenever you hover over any of these buttons, which have a shortcut assigned to them. It's just going to get you comfortable with that much faster. Now, the other things when it comes to the uh, movement, the transform editing of the assets in the world. One other thing to note is the options we have here. We have our position snapping, our rotational snapping, and our scaling snapping. So all of these are set to snap at the moment, uh, but because the numbers are so small, you probably didn't notice that it is snapping. So if we make the uh, grid snapping, which is when we move things around much larger, we'll now see that it's very clear that snapping is on. That is moving 256 units, which is in Unreal centimeters, so 256 centimeters every time we move the mouse enough. If we turn this off, then we get completely smooth movement, so we can move this exactly where we want. And again, just as simple as toggling, blue is on, gray is off. And we can do this for rotation, so at the moment we're rotating in 10 degree units, but we can increase or decrease this to get much bigger and snappier rotation. So we have that option for all of these, I think 10 and 4 is pretty much fine for those. And then the final thing is you're probably going to want to be moving around quite a lot. Moving around in the viewport is the kind of ghost camera that you're probably familiar with. Clicking any of the mouse buttons will kind of hook you into the screen, as you can see here. And then if you press W, A, S or D, so your WASD movement, then you fly around. Now, when you're flying, you can increase the uh, movement speed by scrolling the mouse wheel forward or slow it down by scrolling the mouse wheel back, so towards you. And you can also change the camera movement speed here. So that's going to control how fast you move. Uh, when you're flying around so make sure you don't make that too high it can get somewhat snappy but again you do have control of that with the mouse wheel as well so again just get familiar with that so holding a mouse key and then 
pressing W, A, S, and D will move you around. You also have Q to go down, E to go up. So very standard kind of ghost spectator pawn movement uh, that we're looking at here. And then if there's something that you can see in the distance, so let's say that I wanted to edit this mountain, another useful thing to know is that we can click this and remember that short key that I mentioned earlier. So F to focus, that will bring us in uh, roughly in like an average position close to that mountain. So because it's so big, it actually puts us quite far away. If we find a smaller object, so let's go back to our chair. I know that we had a chair over here. We can search for one of the armchairs in our search bar. If we press F, that will take us and home us straight in on our armchair. So a nice quick way to navigate around, especially when the maps start getting bigger. Uh, just knowing how to navigate is going to be super useful. Now on top of this, what we're loaded into at the moment is a level called Simple. So we can see our active level up in this tab. So this actual world, this map that I've created, is called Simple. If we go to the Content Browser, we can go to Simple Content. So it's already provided a folder named simple content based on the name that I gave the project. It automatically creates a level, which is the one that we're in here. So levels are this yellow underlined tab, and it provides some basic information for use in this level. So if you wanted to create a new level and maybe start fresh, we'd go up to file, new level, and we create a new level based on any of the existing templates. We can create uh, to, to cut down on the loading whilst I'm recording the video. We're going to go with a blank level. We'll create this. Uh, save any changes if you wanted to in the current level. So save selected. And then this will create a, a brand new level. Uh, it starts off as untitled. And you can see that this is just an empty map. So if you make some changes in here, you want to keep this. Uh, we have our player starts. We'll go into those a little bit later. Uh, but we'll press Control in S because... Anything that we see in the editor with this small asterisk means that this hasn't been saved. Uh, so if we just press Control in S, it will automatically know that we want to save this level. Uh, we'll put this in the simple content, and I'll just call this one New Test Map. We'll save the new test map, and what we can see again, opening up the content drawer, so Control and Space, we have New Test Map has just been added uh, with some HLOD detail, so uh, level of detail asset for this map. So that's as difficult as it is to open and load new levels. And then if you wanted to go back to your other one, we can just control and space, go back to this content drawer, and we can now swap between these. One thing that I do see new students doing quite a lot is going up to file, uh, open level, navigating this way. So just a few extra mouse clicks again, and hopefully it shows that if you just get familiar with the shortcut keys, control and space is so much faster and easier to open up these things and just switch between these. You can also just press control and N to create a new level. So N for new. Uh, that will create a new level. So again, just start practicing these keys. Uh, I will keep re-emphasizing this because I do see a lot of people taking much longer to do things just because they don't take that initial time to learn the shortcuts. So Control and N to create a new map uh, and you can create as many of these as you want. Start putting them in your folders. Now, when it comes to your folder structure, it is going to be quite nice to organize this. So this is already getting somewhat crowded and we have different assets. So what might be nice here is we can press Control, Shift and N. So that will create a new folder. Control Shift and N. We'll rename this one to Maps. And what I'm going to do is just Control Select and drag the maps into this folder. Press Move here. We'll say that's okay. It's just telling us that some of the references in the information files may need to be updated because we're moving things. And we can see that we now have a folder dedicated just to our maps. And this is the way that you'll want to begin organizing your project in general. So when we start adding classes and meshes, and you can see that's been done here. So basically just following the official kind of process that Epic take. So when you have your devices, which are your functionalities in, in the game, your mechanics, then the devices will go into a devices folder, your textures will go into a textures folder, meshes into meshes, and so on. It just helps you keep the project nice and tidy, makes it much easier to find things. And again, I know it's very boring kind of up front, but this will save you so much time as the project gets bigger, just to keep things tidy and easy to navigate around and find things. And then just before wrapping up the general interface and browser overview, uh, one thing that people do find useful and you might like to know is that we can change the colors of the folders. Now this may seem really mundane and pointless, but it's shown that in studies, people will be able to more quickly identify things if they're color coded. And in fact, we even see this with the assets. So just to go back over this, if we go into a texture folder and find the textures, you'll find that all textures have a red bar underneath and you just get somewhat familiar with this. So sound effects, again, have a different color for the, the different types of sound files that you can work with. So sound cues are blue. We have the control bus, which is 
a pinky color. Uh, so all of these, again, are, are color coded. And you can do the same thing with your folders, because as I said, uh, it's been shown that people just more quickly identify when things are color coded in this way. So we can come in, right click on a, a folder, and we can set the color. Now, the logical thing to do here would be to set it to a sim similar color to uh, the, the asset types that the folder is holding, which this one, I suppose, technically already is. Uh, but if we look in the textures, uh, we can set the color of textures. I said that was red. So we'll make this more of a, a reddish color. And then at a glance, what we have is that we'll know that when we get used to things being color coded already inside of Unreal, we'll know that the, the textures is the, the red folder that we're looking for. And if we have these nested in different places, hopefully it just makes them a little bit easier to find. And again, just speeds up that workflow.